Hi everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How is everyone doing? It is Tuesday, February 22nd. What it means is that it is time to tell some stories. It is 7.30 a.m. in the U.S., well, at least in New York, and it is about 12.30-ish, uh, somewhere around Ghana and, you know, that part of the world. I welcome you. I welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you are any part in any part of the world, but mainly in any part of Africa, we want to uh, greet you in your local dialect like we always do because, hey, we're Africans and we are communal people, right? Hey, ibi okibari to you if you speak Moshi. Baraka da zua, sanunku da zua, yayade, kakwana lafia. How are you? How are you doing? I just greeted you in Hausa. Ya ken ken, futuma tuma, fudu wela, tuma awela, tupusi wunam baraka, la awane, ansuma to you and and Ansuma Huganya Songo to you, Dasuba to you, Dinle. I just greeted you in different variations of the Kusal, the Mamproli, the Frafra, the Wale, the Gari all um, in the northern parts of Ghana where, hey, yours truly comes from, you know. <laughs> in Dinao to you, how are you? If you are in the Volta region of Ghana or you speak Ebe, I greet you, I greet you. Wezo, leke, efwa, how are you? Are you doing well? I hope you are. Thank you so much for joining us. Woo, I see the chat room is already blowing up and I'm already so, so excited. Tell your te if you speak ga, how are you? OJ, ko to you, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I am so, so, so glad you are here. Ekaro to you, um, ekabo if you speak Yoruba, nabata to you if you speak Igbo. God bless you for joining us. I am so grateful. Um, <laughs> a messiere to you, or to to you. Uh, for, that is the Ibibio dialect, the Yoruba dialect, of course, and the Igbo dialect. Listen, our, our our Nigerian viewers, can you teach me how to say more welcomes and more uh, good mornings in different other uh, dialects? I want to learn. I want to learn. I do want to learn. Our teleprompter is moving ever so slow this morning it is ridiculous at the saying akwaba we greet you we greet you i am so so glad you are here <laughs> Karibu sana to you. Karibu sana to you. Habari gani? Karibu iyaure to you. If you are Luo and you you are in Kenya, Murembe to you. Habari ya usubwe to you. Shani to you. Uh, I just learned how to say hello and uli shani in the Bemba uh, language. Those of you in Zambia, I greet you. Mwanji to you and muli mwanji to you if you are in Zambia. Um, this is the Nyanja. Uh, people of Zambia. Thank you so much for joining us. I am so glad you're here. I want it to you from the Mendes of Sierra Leone, of course, and Mangwanani to you, Makadii to you, all of the people of Shona in Zimbabwe. I greet you. Linjani to you from the Ndebeles of Zimbabwe. Nagadef, how are you? Those of you who speak Wolof and are in Senegal, I greet you. I greet you. Thank you for joining us. Inyasi, Aloy, Domilaki, uh, the people of Burkina Faso. I realize that I'm not saying that word right. Burkina Faso, I greet you, I greet you. Azul, Walo to you, Mak Makev to you, and of course, Maraba to you. If you speak um, Beba and you are in the south, the part of Morocco and, you know, Marrakesh, I greet you, I greet you. Welcome into the room. Thank you for joining us. Kotong and Amohelang to you, all of you who speak Sosoto. Um, I'm so thankful you're here, of course. Akei, Creole people. Now my to you, Maori to you, um, the now my are uh, from the Maori people. Why am I rumbling? I don't know. I will slow down. <laughs> Dumela to you if you are Soto and um, you know you are in South Africa. Saubonani to you, the people of Zulu. Kotoli to you if you speak Fulani. I greet you. I greet you. Of course, bonjour, guten morgen, bonjourno. Dobroyo otro, bom dia. Of course, buenos dias. Welcome, welcome. I'm trying to get all of the languages in, and it gets really difficult, you know, because I don't want to forget anybody. If I forgot you, that was not intentional. I do want to greet you in your local dialect. So please, please, please 
please, please, please reach out and let us know how to greet you properly, okay? Today's going to be an exciting day because we're going to have an in-house and out-house because we want to have this discussion with you, um, um, conversation of African literature, all of the books we read when we were growing up, you know, um, and this is in conjunction with Book Nook. Uh, Book Nook is a publishing house in Ghana and they ship everywhere in the world and they are <laughs> our powerhouse that is about to overtake Amazon by leaps and bounds. So before I introduce our uh, very able indomitable producers who are here with me today to talk about some of these books and how they've affected us, let us get a little message uh, from Book Nook, okay? All right guys, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Serious question. How come I look so different from the people in the books I read? Their homes, their food, their celebrations feel so different. Parents, we should not discount these as mere kids' questions. They often struggle with their identities, and this is crucial for their development. Let's begin with exposure. Reading brings exposure and enlightenment, but not just reading, reading materials that resonate with your identity. Reading books by our Ghanaian authors on our heritage, our culture, our occasions, our folklore, our history, our way of life, reading about everything that there ever was. But more importantly, reading material that are written by us. Well, welcome back. Oh my God. Um, this is a message brought to you by Book Nook. We encourage you to go to booknook.store uh, or booknook.com. And please, please, that is where you get all of the books that we're about to discuss today and many, 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 many more. My name is Zoe Baraka. Listen, um, African literature is not only important because of its relevant setting and relatable storylines. It also increases our social consciousness and raises awareness of social, political, and economic crisis, triumphs, pitfalls, and success of the African continent. Through our gifted writers and storytellers in Africa, history has been preserved and is still being preserved today. This is why we are here today, okay, to continue this leg legacy and act as gatekeepers of said various histories for posterity. My co-hosts and co-discussion panelists today are our very own, to my younger self, producer extraordinaires, Yidana Hamid Kobigbila, who is not only a producer, but also one of Ghana's premier documentary filmmakers with a wealth of knowledge in all things film and photography. And of course, the queen herself, the queen of event organizing and production. Listen, if you want anything done and you tell this woman, she will get it done, okay? Uh, she is the general, at least that's how I call her, the general Oba of divine connectors, constantly filled to the brim with witty ideas and inventions, my very own big sister and one of Canada's greatest lawyers, my personal confessor, and a woman I have absolutely refused to share with anybody, not even my own blood sisters. I will not share her, okay? <laughs> Yes, yes, I am talking about the one and the only Elsie Dix Dixon. Ladies and gentlemen, like we always do, like we always do over here at, at To My Younger Self, please help me welcome. First, my uncle, my bro uncle, Yidana. Hi. Hello, Zoe. <laughs> and Hi, here we everyone. go. <laughs> there we go, the Oba herself, Elsie yeah, Dixon. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Zoe, your titles. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Yeah. Good afternoon. <laughs> Listen, I see the chat room. <laughs> the chat room. 
<laughs> the chat room is blowing up. So let me, let me just say hello to a few people and we're going to take off. Listen, I see Ralia is here. Good morning, my dear. Um, Beverly Ross is here, one of our biggest top fans. Baba Fawson, we see you. Jane, hi, how are you? Sebi M, I see you, I see you. Um, oh my God, Audrey is here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Casper, Pastor Casper, thank you for joining us. Francisca Ado, I see you. Um, Abena Ejewa Enchi, I see you. <laughs> Sedi, hello. Another one of our producers who is not with us today, but hey, there'll be other times. You know what I mean? Salmis Abi, wow, wow. We are blessed today. Guys, if I didn't say hello to you, it was not intentional. Kofi, I see you. Thank you for joining us. God bless you. Stay tuned because today we have a lot of uh, questions and, 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 and we're going to have fun today. So just hang in there. Ralia, I ban you. You are not part of this quiz at all. Okay. You cannot be a part of this quiz. Case closed. <laughs> hey, 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 Pastor Teresa, we see you. We're so glad you are here. All right. We're going to take off. Um, so, you know, in my introduction, I would say talking about African literature and, you know, all the books we have read, uh, the Chinua Chibes, the uh, David Diops, the um, uh, Maria Mambas, you know, or Ba. I never know how to say her last name. <laughs> Uh, um, you know, and just so many other writers that have influenced us. I'm going to take off with um, Uncle Yidana. Uh, okay, no, he's Yidana today. So Yidana, I'm going to take off with you. <laughs> I swear I have the note right here. Do not say Uncle or Big Sis today. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, you, well, uh, yeah. you talk off with us, since you're the only man uh, here today, what or what are some of the books that have impacted you greatly and are still impacting you um, concerning African literature? I remember Paysetters, African writers, Penguin writers, uh, Penguin publishers, Heinemann publishers, all these books coming out of, of, of these publishing house. Um, the question is over to you. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll say a lot. Um, the Chino Achibes, the Olaro Timis, uh, mm -hmm. Sipra Nekwensi, Amata Edo, and all of that. Um, growing up, I mean, I, I would grab anything to read, uh, not just limited to African writers, but of course, you know, writers from across the world. Um, and so, uh, I mean, books often fascinated me. Uh, mm -hmm. In your description, you invited audience to come on a journey with you. And uh, it, it was, I mean, books for me served as uh, the ticket to travel anywhere. So even though you would not see me moving physically, I found myself in various parts of the world. I mean, very well-traveled person uh, through books, you know. And so I love uh, it. I mean, the, the, the impact that they've had on me, uh, it, it's just, I don't even know how to describe it. Uh, my mm -hmm. second son, um, Kimathi, uh you know he has the name kimathi because of one of the books i read growing up you know in, in secondary oh, wow. school i know and the book I read, oh. it, yes ngubi watiango's uh, the trial of Dan kimathi and of course uh if you read that book you would you know get to know how enigmatic that character is what he meant to the independence struggle um uh, mm -hmm. You know, and of course the values, you know, of, of freedom and equal rights and all of that. Uh, but of course, since we are celebrating Black History Month, um, you know, the story of Didan Kimati, as told by the colonialists, was one of, you know, a brute, a savage, you know, a terrorist. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, like we always say in Africa, if you allow, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the hunter to tell the story, uh, of course, the lion is always a conquered. Mm. And so that book for me, uh, for someone like uh, Ngugi Wathiango, uh, and then, you know, he co-authored it with someone, uh, I, I, I don't easily remember the name, mm -hmm. but for me, it was the retelling of the story of Didan Kimati, mm. uh, which was in direct contrast to what the colonialists you know, I wanted us to know. Mm. And didn't Kimati for me signified as Africans, 
whose stories have been told by people. I mean, we've been here and yet other people discovered us. <laughs> you know, and so that book, uh, for me, growing up, it had a lot of impact uh, on me. I could be walking on the streets, but find myself in the courtroom, you know, listening to Dida Kimati defend himself. Mm. Uh, I could be walking on the street and I find myself in the forest, you know, uh, with the Mama freedom fighters and all of that. And so that, that, is, that is the impact to the extent that, you know, I, I felt that my second son should be called Kimathi, you know. Wow. Uh, wow. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Wow. Um, you know, so, so that's, that's one of the, the, the books. I mean, of course, that's the play. Uh, mm -hmm. There are other books. One of them is uh, Didan Kimati on trial, but the play mm -hmm. is the trial of Didan Kimati. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, in short, I'll just you know say this is uh, using the trial of Didan Kimati. This is the kind of impact that uh, you know uh, books have had on me. Uh, I don't know if I should go ahead and mention other titles. Um, you 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 We're you, you, come kind back. Of, you kind of tricked me into uh, you know going at it uh, because I wanted to see you know even though I'm the only man here. But of course, I don't forget the lessons that I was taught that ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did introduce and all of that. So I take consul I've been following in that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're definitely gonna come back because you know we're we're we're, we're just gonna be picking up stories and telling them. Um, let me ask the audience our very first question. Um, and here's how this game is going to go. We're gonna ask as many questions as possible. And at the end of today's show, we're going to have a pool and whoever got the most questions gets the grand prize. We're, good, we're not gonna um, announce the grand prize yet, but whoever wins, the most questions or answers the most questions will be the person that wins this prize. Okay. First question. Are you guys ready? Ding, 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 ding. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Who said blackness is not all that makes a man and from which book? Here's the question again. Who said blackness is not all that makes a man and from which book? <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm waiting. I'm waiting to see some answers. I'm waiting to see some answers. All right. Um, Elsie, over to you. What are some of the books? Um, I know that you and I uh, just took us off with the play, and I don't know if you want to start off with the play, a poem, or a book, but over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when we first decided to talk about this, I, I said to myself, mm -hmm that, I mean, how do you open a door to talk about books for me and expect me to keep it short? It's a near impossibility to even pick what... two, three tops. <laughs> no, I'm not, don't worry. I'm not gonna wax <laughs> lyrical and interminably, but it's just hard to pick a favorite book mm. because you would know this and those who are close to me would know that English is not my first language. Mm -hmm. French is my first language and I learned English as a second language. Yeah. And for me, books were one of the ways in which I learned English. So I was always, like Eden I said, I was always my nose in a book. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was known to carry books to church. Mm -hmm. I was known to carry books anywhere I could sneak a line to read. And so... Uh -huh. Um, going into secondary school back in the day when um, English and literature and English were compulsory subjects, those were my favorite spaces to be mm -hmm. because I didn't have to hide a book on my lap during chemistry class to read. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have to, you know, tuck the book into, you know, wherever I could sneak it after lights out with a flashlight. This, I was happy to be in this class, particularly, and like yet I also enjoyed all genres. But there was something about African literature that helped me find identity. Mm. Whether it was in drama, whether it was in prose, whether it was in poetry, it just sucked you in. Now, as a young person, a lot of the time you read for pleasure, but you were so focused on examination. Yes. You, were, you were reading so that you could write an exam. Yeah. And pass the mission. <laughs> right? You know, and for many other subjects, it was true, poor, pass, forget. But for literature, there's just something about it. Yes, the goal at the time was um, was to pass an exam, but it sowed seeds in, 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 in me and in my heart. Mm -hmm. um, and over the last few years, I've made an intentional decision to go back to the books that we studied mm 
uh, for exams to reread them through adult lens. And I'm rediscovering old favorites I had forgotten about. And I'm seeing depth to them mm -hmm. that I didn't quite catch as a young person. And one of those books is Maria Mabel's So Long a Letter. Oof. That book, anytime we're talking about books, some way, somehow, chat rooms just blow up. People get animated because So Long a Letter just resonates with just about everybody I know. Yeah. And so I started reading So Long a Letter. It was originally uh, written in French. Um, and and I, started re I, I had the privilege of studying it both in French and in English. Mm -hmm. But there was something about the story. And it's a letter between two girlfriends, old girlfriends. And so that already connects with me because mm -hmm. it's like sitting down with a friend you've known from childhood. Yes. And life yeah. events have happened. And at one critical point in the author's life where her husband dies suddenly, mm -hmm. she writes to her old girlfriend and says, I need to talk to you. You know my life. And at a time like this, this letter is going to be the prop in my distress. And she proceeds to take us on a journey of what it means to be uh, bereaved in the African setting. She talks about colonialism and, and uh, she talks about going to boarding school. She talks about being a young professional. Mm -hmm. She talks about the, the tug and the pull of tradition mm -hmm. and, and modernization. And, and she talks about family relations. All of these things as a child, you pick up on and identify as themes. But as an adult, when you go back to read it, now it's lived experience. And so for me, that's why, you know, Miami Best So Long A Letter is one of my favorite books. I mean, I could go on and on about that book and I'll share some quotes later, but to answer your question in a very long-winded way, give me Miami Best So Long A Letter any day. Any day. Any wow, day. any day. You know, that book, <laughs> I remember feeling extremely angry. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess maybe because I, of where I was born, I could actually see it because I was born into a Muslim environment or an Islamic environment. Um, I saw some of the, the not so pleasant situations that women were put through um, for, firsthand. And <laughs> they, they just came alive for me. And, you know, now that I'm older, I am beginning to realize just how much pizzazz that woman had in those days for her to write such a radical book, you know, that discussed divorce and um, um, extramarital affairs, um, all these things that didn't seem like... <laughs> You know, they seemed like they were covered up. Even, at, I mean, in the 80s, you couldn't even talk about those things. And she wrote that book, what, in the 70s, 60s? And she herself was a woman who was married three times and had the privilege of not only going to primary school, but went even further ahead in her education. That blew my mind. And I think maybe that's why she resonates with a lot of African women. It was the liberation, the freedom, the wherewithal to write such a book that just had so much spunk, but also a lot of truth. That idea of the fact that she didn't even have, <laughs> she was not with her husband technically, but the moment he passed away, she was supposed to go and be in hiding for 40 days. And suddenly her life just goes into shambles. I know a lot of women, even today in the 2000s, you know, are dealing with this in this millennium. So that's what Maria, Maria Mamba's book did for me, the radicality of it, the mere just, I do not care what anybody thinks, this is me and I know me. That's yeah. what that book did for me. Um, I'm going to ask the audience what that book did for them. And it looks like we do not have <laughs> an answer for our first question. Was that very difficult? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my good God. Um, okay. We are uh, just going to keep you know, uh, keeping the tap. Here's another question for you. <laughs> I'm going to try to pick an easy one. Okay, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, let's see. Complete this saying from Chinua Achibe, things fall apart. I hope you're listening. Complete the saying from Chinua Achibe, things fall apart. 
He who brings cola. K-O-L-A. He who brings cola. What is the next words or word or sentence? He who brings cola. <laughs> We're going to put it in the chat line. Okay. All right. Uh, for me, uh, in answer to that question, one of my, one of my favorite books um, that I, 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 I'm looking around for my father in, in the chat room because he definitely is expecting that I say this. But one of my favorite books, actually one of the very first ones, the first book I read um, from uh, African writers or pacers was The Oil Man of Obanje. But we're not going to talk about that today. My dad and I had a ritual because I was so far away in boarding school. What we would do is I would read the book and I want to believe he obviously read it too. And my task was to summarize what I read in the book in a letter because we had a letter writing tradition. This is where the phrase to whom much is given, much is expected has stuck with me because my dad always, always signed off his letters to me as to whom much is given, much is expected. And so we would write these letters. He would ask me questions about the book I just read. And so as, after um, The Oil Man of Obanje, the next book I read was Weep Not Child. Um, <laughs> and in those days, much like Elsie, I think I was also reading it just so I could answer questions for my dad, because let me tell you, that man would quiz you in the most dramatic way. The quizzes were not just who were the main characters, you know, what did you get from it? These were like what the questions are, like who said this? So you had to read the book in order to be able to answer it. There was no way around it. This is how I grew up, okay? <laughs> and I was what all of maybe what, eight, maybe 10 at the time. So Weep Not Child for me is what brought the African struggle to the forefront for me even at that age. I really didn't understand all of it. I remember thinking the Mau Mau was a, I remember thinking the Mau Mau was the worst kind of people, uh, the, the worst kind of people put together. Uh, they were slitting throats, they were killing people. They were not only killing the white settlers, they were killing <laughs> Africans. In fact, they killed more Africans in the book than they killed those that they, supposedly started the Mau Mau group for. I remember reading about Jumo Kenyatta first in Weep Not Child. I did not know who he was or what he stood for. I had to grow up a little more to kind of know who Jumo Kenyatta was. Um, I remember thinking that uh, Njoroge, the, the main character, I remember thinking, why did he <laughs> end up so sad? And for the life of me at that time, I didn't even know Ngugi Wationgo was a black man, you know, uh, because of the way the, the story ended. But so let me leave it here. This is one of my earliest memories or one of the earliest books I read myself, Weep Not Child. So many things um, packed in there, uh, you know, hope, betrayal. Um, it not, when I went to film school, I remember now after I, I, I saw Heritage Africa, I could see a lot of the characters from Ngugi Wathiongo's Weep Not Child in Heritage Africa. You know, the Kwesi Atha uh, Busumefi character reminded me of Jacopo in there. So, you know, now I could make and draw some lines and conclusions for myself. Anyway, I'm going to stop my own very long answer here and see if we have an answer. Do we have an answer for our... <laughs> oh, I think we have. Okay, who is our winner? Who is our winner for this round? Ralia, I did say you could not play this. Why I say this is because we have played this game all of our lives. And so she does know the answers to this. You cannot be a part of this competition. You're ruled out, Ralia Sorogo. I am so sorry. So to our gamekeeper, um, I want you to tell us who was the first person to give us the answer to this. And before I come back to Uncle Yudana, since we have a winner for this, here is another question for you. <laughs> who wrote... Our husband has how our husbands have got has our husband has gone mad again. 
here's the question. Who wrote, our husband has gone mad again? Very easy question, right? All right. <laughs> Uncle Yudana, back to you. Um, we're going to talk about yeah. maybe another book that impacted your life. And guys, I want you to tell us what book impacted your life and why. Okay? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Actually, I would want to go back to Elsie's uh, Maria Mabas So Long Letter. Because okay. it's one of the books that is also in my, um, you know, list. Um, <laughs> and among the things that, you know, Elsie spoke about, one thing that I, I, I was hoping to hear you say is mm -hmm. that, you know, it dealt so much about dreams, yes. you know, especially yeah. between these two friends. They had, they had dreams, mm -hmm. you know, some were lived, some they could only imagine what would have happened if they went truth if they had those dreams come real yeah. you know mm -hmm. and uh, the other thing is that you know if you could just bring it back to our african situation our mothers at home our sisters our aunties one thing that is missing is education and you can imagine if my mother for instance you know like maria mabad did mm -hmm. what a world of difference that would bring you know to humanity you know, um, and I and I talk so much about dreams because you know when I read Maria Mabas so long a letter, I it didn't you know it, what what one thing got me to do was to start questioning, and guess the people I started questioning it was my mom and my dad, you know, wow. I questioned them about love, you know, did you love each other, how did you meet, and so ah. I, I I got to hear their stories wait, wait, as well. Wait, wait. Wait, Uncle Yin, wait, 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 did you get an answer? I'm curious. Oh, yes, I did. I mean, uh, you know, my dad was a teacher and, uh, you know, he didn't shy away from telling me, uh, you know, what his experiences wow. were growing up as a young man. Uh, my mom is always happy to bring you memories of, of old and all of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, through Maria Mabasso long a letter, um, and and trust me, uh, I was, I was. I think I had come back to uh, to the house from vacation, and then I was seated writing. And here is my dad thinking that his son is, you know, uh, probably studying and writing, but I was writing a love letter, you know. <laughs> 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 you know. Now, oh now, you know, this this love letter ended up in the hands of the one I was writing to. And she also shared it with her friends. And then anytime he was walking, they would say, oh, that's the one who wrote the letter. <laughs> <laughs> it was not so long a letter, but I mean, you know, yeah. So, so the interesting thing is that when I asked my mom, you know, of course, I shared the story of so long a letter with her. And, and guess what she said? She had never met my dad. She doesn't know my dad from anywhere. All she was told was that she was being given out in marriage to a man, mm. you know. Now, she couldn't say no because her sister, who is my aunt, was who was being in marriage and said, no, I'm not interested. I want to have an education and all of that. And then my, my mom was someone who was so close to the father, you know, the father king. Mm. And uh, she said, look, uh, I'm going to obey you, daddy, but mm. there's one wish I would, I would want you to, to grant. And that is, you know, to see this man, you know, who is he? I mean, uh, I just want to have a look at this man. So, yes, they did invite my dad. Uh, and then he came and then my mom, you know, from somewhere, he didn't even know what was going on. So my mom had a look at him for the first time and said, mm, uh, well, maybe uh, he, he looks like someone I would love. And, and, and so that was it. You know, they shipped her to my wow. dad. And then, you know, uh, again, like we had in so long a letter, the various relationships of, of friendship, of hopes, of dreams, of love, you know, it, it played out. And by being a product of these two, who also had their dreams separately, because my dad also, of course, he had some girls he used to check out, but they you know, so they both had to live their dreams, you know, and, and, and the love they were perceiving wow. to come together and make this relationship work. You know, and I and I lived through this, you know, to see how my mom on one hand wanted to actually complete her education, but of course, not because of my dad, but through Ghana's political situation, the coup d'etat and all of that, 
she couldn't continue, you know. Uh, but then later on, you know, when my dad retired, uh, he wouldn't go stay by his books, but he would actually go to the market and sit with her, you know, and, and oh. she would sell and they would be chatting, you know. And these are two people from, I mean, you can imagine people who don't know each other and then they get sure. married and then, you know, they, they become friends and they actually get to love each other, you know. Then the other way was when my dad passed and I actually saw the depth with which my mom actually loved him, you know, and reading his diaries to see how he also actually loved and appreciated my mom. So yes, sometimes in the African situation, you know, uh, people could get together, you know, by faith, by tradition, uh, you know, uh, but they could end up actually making a beautiful relationship out of, you know, of course, that would go horribly wrong, but I would want to yeah. celebrate, you know, uh, what came out of the relationship between my mom and my dad, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, who got connected, not through a letter, but of course, you know, through the wishes of, of their parents and, 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 and relatives. You know, so that's just a little I wanted to add to Elsie's, uh, you know, uh, review or, um, you know, dreams about some of the books that we have read. Yes, yeah, so long wow. a letter brought out that uh, inquisitiveness in me to begin to question the relationship between, you know, the people closest to me, my mom and my dad. Yes. Wow. Yes. yes. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. That's a very, that's an amazing story. Um, but yeah. Lisa says that is a beautiful story. Yes, it is. The fact that your dad would go and sit in the market, you know, with your mom, just so he could get to know her a little better. Um, it, it sounds like a Western idea. And so it tells you that love really knows no continent, basically. You know, they make it sound like it's supposed to be and that, you know, Africans did not really know the concept of love or how to get together and all that stuff and th this is proof you know that this actually <laughs> love is a, a universal language like we all know and we find ways to feel the love and I really I applaud your dad for actually being able to do that because for one reason or another most often than not much like in Mariamaba's book men or most men are painted as you know, quiet and privileged, you know, they just sit and everything comes to them and they do with it whatever they <clears throat> want to do with it. But if this story is anything to go by, we now know that there are men out there, African men out there, who will go a step further to uh, perpetuate the act of love or the idea of love and and, and get into it. Um, let's see, let's see. There's a, a couple of comments here. here. Uh, all days marriage, we'll pick that one. <laughs> Over <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> Some of us are in today, so you know, we <laughs> we kind of have to be hoping that today's love will be good too, right? Right. Um. Okay. Okay. Oh, oh Zoe, says, if you could oh, permit oh, me, uh, if you could permit me, you know, um, you know, religion also plays out so strongly in my realm about so long a letter, and I'll go back to my mom again. My mom married my dad, a Christian. She was actually called Christiana. My dad, Muslim. Wow. That they got married. Now, eventually, my mom did convert to Islam. Mm. And I dare say, um, you know, she she learned so much about Islam. And I, sometimes I see her telling my dad certain things about Islam, you know, that my dad didn't even know. Now, interestingly, we, the products of this marriage, you know, we are six, right? The first is a, is a girl, my big sister. Uh, second is me, uh, and then the, the you know the rest, the, the four that are after me. Now the first two, that's my big sister and myself. We are Christian, and then the the last four are Muslim. <laughs> you know, so again, uh, you know the two religions could could blend and produce you know kids who would subscribe to both faiths and live yeah. together you know without you know any issues. You know, but of course yeah. you know I, I would want to say that. You know, some of the things discussed in uh, so long a letter, especially concerning religion, I would say also has, you know, the African traditional element. This yes. issue of polygamy, um, mm. you know, of course we can say Islam, but traditionally, you know, those who don't have any religion, you can call them pagans. In, in our setting, you would have a man marrying, you know, more than one woman, you know. So uh, a lot of the time when people ascribe to, to Islam, it's just like something closer to what is already already cultural and traditional for them, you know. Uh, so th these are some of the complexities. And uh, 
so long later brings us so much. You know, the themes are just so many that we cannot, uh, you know, finish in one uh, review. Yeah. So this yeah, with this, we can move on to our next. <laughs> wow. yes. And that is amazing because I, yeah. I am a product of that too. My mom had to, who was a Christian, you know, got married to a man who was uh, a Muslim at the time and had to convert into uh, to become a Muslim. And then eventually she reverted back to Christianity. And so we all grew up Christian, but this is what we, anyway, we're gonna leave it there because then we would just keep going. We all know how that goes. So um, I'm gonna revert back to uh, Elsie, but before I do that, I was gonna pick another question for our audience. Um, drum roll, please, drum roll, please. <laughs> Okay, here we go. This should be an easy one. Okay, again, Radlia, your band. I, I think I have to keep saying that so she doesn't answer this. <laughs> <laughs> what was the original title of Mariama Bass' So Long a Letter? What was the original title of Mariama Bass' So Long a Letter? Okay, all right. Uh, the competition is open and we are ready for the answers. The first uh, winner was Baba Forsen. The second winner for the second question was Audrey. And um, yeah, we are going to see if there's a third person and it looks like we're losing yet, but we'll keep the conversation going and he's going to come back on. All right, Elsie, over to you. Uh, second book. Um, I think one of the things that um, African literature did for us was uh, and no matter what book it was, there was a theme of community that ran through it. Family, community, communal living. And reading it at a time, I mean, back then when I was in, you know, secondary school, I was, this was in the 80s, right? And even then, community had been redefined a little bit more insularly. So it was more, you know, it was more and more becoming nuclear family focused. Uh, yes, we knew who our aunties and our uncles and our grandparents and such were, but we didn't live together. Mm -hmm. and so uh, reading through all these books, you, you were just fascinated with communal living. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the themes that ran through, you know, so long a letter, we're moving from that. But I think of Achebe's uh, Things Fall Apart. And I'm going to read a quote from it, which, you know, reminds me of community. Mm -hmm. It says, a man who calls his kinsmen to a feast does not do so to save them from starving. Yes. We all have food in their own homes. When we gather together in the moonlit village ground, it is not because of the moon. Each man can see it from his own compound. We come together because it is good for kinsmen to do so. Mm. And a quote like that just resonates so deeply with me because we're living so far apart now. Yes. And it was such that, oh, I see from the chat that, uh, can you hear me now, Yid? Yid says he can't hear me, but can uh, everybody else hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. We can hear you. And so, Hopefully Yid is able to hear you soon. I hope so. Yeah. And so um, reading a quote like that, just brings home to me the 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 power in communal living. Mm. You saw it in the grieving process in Miami Bar. You saw it in different points of you know things fall apart. You saw it in you know Sons and Daughters mm. by Jody Graft. You saw it. Pick any book. Yes. Not the more of a ghost. <laughs> exactly. Pick any book mm. and at core was communal living because that's so mm. integral to our identity as Africans, as Black people. And uh, when I think of the, the influences of modern life and the fact that we've been thrown to the far edges of the world, no doubt these stories are calling us back home mm. because we come back to them with a certain nostalgia. And just like the chat room, people, you know, going down the strip down memory lane, all of a sudden it's like a call home. And I guess that's my challenge as I reread these books. You know, I've got um, Things Fall Apart. I've got Kobna Sechi's The Blinkards. Mm -hmm. There was a country. I, ha I am on a quest, wow. a personal quest to bring home back closer through the books I'm reading. Mm -hmm. 
I'm hearing an echo. Is it yeah, just... I think we have an echo. I think it's coming from Yit's phone, most likely. Uh, Yit, I don't know if you can hear us, but we do hear an echo. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, for one reason, I cannot hear Elsie. Um, oh, so sorry. let me let me leave the studio and join in, and then see if that's okay. All right, I'll we're gonna solve it that way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Go ahead, Elsie. Yeah. And so and so um for me when I think back of all the life events we've had in the past today, every life event is a call to come home. Mm. And I think of our festivals back home. Everybody, no matter where they're living, they go back to their hometown. For a festival, you know, yes. For a festival. When there's a funeral, everybody gathers back to mm. the heart of the home. Mm. Um, when there's a wedding, when a child is born, all of these things are documented in our literature. Mm. And as we read them, I guess my challenge to everybody is find a way of reconnecting with home. Mm. Th now, thankfully, we have, um, you know, technology. But if the point of a story, as we gathered by the moon that we could all see in our different compounds, but if we gather together, to tell stories and to look at the same moon and to sing songs. There is a responsibility on us, not just to read these books and remember and, and have fond memories, but there's a responsibility to pass it on to the next generation. Mm. The question is, how are we doing that? And I can't continue this conversation without paying homage to the new African writers. Mm. You know, we are at the stage where we look back fondly, but the truth is African writing is still happening today. And so I challenge everybody, as you're going back to the Routinis, as you're going back to the Mariama Bas, as you're going back to the Achebes, you know, Amate Dus and Co, look out for the new writers as well, mm. you know, and, and, and you know, the BCA Japons, the Nana Red Damwes, the, the Elizabeth Irene Beatties. Yes. Look out for the people that are writing the African literature of today because they will be our children's yesterday. And if we don't do to them what our parents did to us, mm -hmm. yes, it made us roll our eyes sometimes. Yes, we felt there's a lot of pressure on us, but there's a certain responsibility. Back in the day was through oral tradition. We don't have that as much now, the oral tradition that carried stories. Now it's in the written books. Mm -hmm. So it's even increasingly more important to remember that community in the quotes, as, as I, I, I just referred to, community is critical. We have to be intentional about doing that, particularly those of us who, for one reason or other, find ourselves physically away from home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm very passionate about this. Let me pause here and then, yeah. you know, pass it on to somebody else. Yes. And I think we have a winner for the last question. That took a lot of doing, didn't it? <laughs> Kofi, congratulations. <laughs> um, Big Sis, can you uh, just, you know, read that in French for us? Because, you know, we... Some of us, you know. So the French title of uh, So Long a Letter is In Si Long Letter. Okay. Yeah, what she said. <laughs> what she said. We're going to leave it there. <laughs> All right. Actually, and before, before I go, let me just read this one more quote that says, books saved you, having become your refuge they sustained you mm. the power of books this marvelous invention of astute human intelligence various signs associated with sound different sounds that form a word juxtaposition of words that springs the idea thought history science life the sole instrument of interrelationships and of culture mm. and parallel and paralleled means of giving and receiving books mm. knit generations together in the same continuing effort that leads to progress they enabled you to better yourself. What society refused you, they granted. That was true then, and it's still very true today. How powerful is that? Just, yeah. wow. Yeah. And uh, I, I wanted to say that what we're doing now is community us coming together and talking about books from long ago, you know, and also even now I see Maji Maj is in the is in, in, in the audience. She is an example of what one of our um our our current writers. I saw that Jalia Jalia was here, another example of one of our current um African writers. So you know uh, like Dixis said, 
as we go back, you know, what uh, To My Younger Self is really about is going back to move forward. So as we're going back, let us not forget to move forward by, you know, reaching out and, and grabbing these new authors and reading from their minds also. This is how we will gatekeep, right? <laughs> All right. Um, I have another question coming up because, you know, we, we're, we're, we're probably going to have a tie and we do not want that. So let's have another question. Uh, let us see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. I, I want to pick uh, an interesting one. OK, in this section, let's do this. Name the book and the author based on the following short description. Name the book and the author based on the following short description. Anansi decides to find a husband for his daughter. Name the book and the author based on the following short description. Anansi decides to find a husband for his daughter. A daughter. So who wrote the book and what is the title of the book? There we go. All right. We're going to wait in the chat room and see who answers this. <laughs> I think we have a winner on that one. Oh my God. <laughs> let's see, let's see. Yes, we have a winner. We have a winner. Pastor Teresa is there. Whew. We have four people now, and we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna need to have a, a, a tiebreaker. All right, so I'll give another question before we go on to Uncle Yid. Here's one. Um, let's see. Uh Amalinze the cat is floored and the legend is born. Amalinze the cat is floored and a legend is born. All right. Let us, <laughs> Uncle Yid, over to you. What will be your uh, second book that you, or well, third book maybe that you would like, or maybe a play or a poem? I have a poem coming up. Hello. Maybe he can't hear us. Oh, maybe it's he can't bad. hear us. Oh man, honestly, Ghana, we need to do better. Okay, this internet situation is always the case, right? Well, I'll move on and I'll I, I'll I'll go in and, and talk about one of the books um, or, or poems that has uh, that impacted me a lot. You know, um, growing up, I I was. Christian, of course. I became a Christian uh, in, I don't know, maybe class five, class four-ish. But it was more of a wholesale Christianity. Everybody was doing it, so you do it too. You become born again and all that good stuff. But um, as I grew up, I began to question Christianity a lot. <laughs> I mean, a lot. Uh, and, and to be quite honest with you, sometimes I still have questions even today. Not so much, but I still do. One of the poems that really took me into a place where I really had to question what my belief system was, because I could see the stark reality in front of me, was um, Kofi Awuno's The Cathedral. Um, and I will read a little bit of it. <laughs> was it The Cathedral? What The Cathedral... The, Cathedral, yes, but this one is actually also the weaver. Those poems are kind of infused together. It, they get me confused. But here is what I will read to you. It says, the weaver bird built in our house and laid its egg on our only tree. We did not want to send it away. We watched the building of the nest and supervised the egg laying. And the weaver returned in the guise of the owner. <laughs> preaching salvation to us that owned the house. They say it came from the West, where the storms at sea had felled the gulls and the fishes dried their nets by lantern light. Its sermon is the divination of ourselves and our new horizon limits at its nest. But we cannot join the prayers and answers of the communicants. <laughs> we look for the new homes every day. For new altars we strive to build, or new altars we strive to rebuild, the old shrines defiled by the weavers, excuse my friend, but it does say that here in the poem, weavers excrement. And I remember back in the day, and I did have long conversations with um, Professor Kofia Wuno myself about this particular poem, um, because 
And also actually our very own um, Jerry John Rollins. I remember, I, I just used to think, or at least from what they would say to me personally and generally was this, we had our own rules and, and, and thoughts and ideas and how we lived. And then somebody came, it's like you're in your house and somebody says, hey, can I just lay by your door because I need a little shelter. And in your goodness, in your um, ability to be hospitable, you open the door just a little bit, you crack it out just a little bit. And all of a sudden, um, the person just comes in with all of his equipment, all of his uh, you know, and has now become the Ethereum, like he owns the house, <laughs> you know, and you didn't participate in the building of your own home. And so for a long time in my mind, <laughs> Christianity was almost like an invasion of privacy of a people, you know, uh, and, and, and I had to re go through a lot of recalibration to find the God in Christianity for myself, because if we had to go or if we had to live by what the history has taught us about what Christianity actually does, I venture to say we all would have cause to think about it. And so this is one of the poems that really gave me cause to really question God, but intelligently, and also realizing at some point that Christianity could not be a wholesale um, 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 religion. It had to be a one-on-one -on -one religion. Mm -hmm. You had to make the decision for yourself because if you look at it as a wholesale practice, I, I, I am very sure none of us will actually be doing that. Mm -hmm. you know, be, be, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And the thing is, um, in, in a lot of the literature, because Christianity was so deeply intertwined with mm -hmm. colonialism and everything it represented and, and and also with slavery and all of that mm -hmm. it, it it became a creation of human beings and that by itself comes with you know a certain pall or a certain taint and it's interesting you should mention that because another we haven't talked much about poetry today mm -hmm. but another poem on the same vein is david diop's vauture the vultures by mm -hmm. david diop Yes. And it, 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 it raises the same questions. It says, you know, and I'm sure many people of our generation will remember this. Mm -hmm. In those days when civilization kicked us in the face, mm -hmm. when holy water slapped our cringing brows, the vultures built in the shadow of their talons, mm -hmm. the blood-stained monument of tutelage in those days. In those there days. was painful laughter on the metallic hell of the roads and mm -hmm. the monotonous rhythm of the paternoster drowned the howling on the plant plantations. Oh, the bitter memories of extorted kisses, hmm. of promises broken at the point of a gun, of promises of foreigners who did not seem human, mm -hmm. who knew all the books but did not know love. Mm -hmm. Nor our hands which fertilized the womb of the earth, hands instinct with the root of revolt, mm -hmm. in spite of your songs of pride in the channel houses, in spite of the desolate villages of Africa torn apart, hope lived in us like a citadel. And from Swaziland's mines to the sweltering sweat of Europe's factories, spring will be reborn under our bright steps. Wow. You know, and 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 poems like that again, and I get I've got goosebumps reading this. I didn't get goosebumps reading it as a child because you don't really don't have grasp it. Yeah. But as you grow, as you question, you know, you realize that, you know, uh, unfortunately, a lot of uh, Christianity as it was brought to us. Now, other religions were brought on the back of self-interest. Yes. And so what we saw in the literature was a pushback Ooh. against Christianity and the bearers or religion and the bearers of that religion, you know, because, you know, they knew all the books, but they did not know love. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. and 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 the monotonous rhythm, the, the, the rote nature of repeating after others without going deep mm -hmm. uh, that drowned out the horrific things that were happening on the plantations but in spite of that hope was reborn and so uh, a lot of our literature talks about you know terrible terrible happenings because it was an outlet for expression whether it was pushing back against you know colonialism or pushing back against you know our own african brothers and sisters who post-colonialism wore the garb 
of the former colonial masters who suppress others. You know, you look at Beggar's Strike and 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 the, the <laughs> that book. Whew. We need to re-examine these things because guess what? The book titles are there, but the reality today is these things are still happening. They're still happening. They're yeah. still happening. And as a society, as a community, as an individual, how are we processing this? How are we having conversations like the one we're having today? Mm. Hopefully, these conversations will continue after we, we stop you know, this broadcast because they're critical to our survival as a people going forward. Mm. We are repeating, unfortunately, some of the lessons uh bitter lessons lessons that you know have soaked the earth with blood sweat and tears mm. we're, we're we're reliving and unfortunately making some of these mistakes mm. today yes and if we're not careful 50 100 years from now they will be saying in those days and they're not talking about colonial africa they're talking about our modern day. Our modern day, yes. What a powerful um, um, poem those two were. Um, and I, I have to apologize. The poem I just read was actually The Weaver, but The Cathedral, I, I did want to read that, but I thought, you know what, soften it up a little bit because that one also was one of the ones that took me down the corridors of asking questions. And this is what we're saying ultimately. These books are there to help us think for ourselves. You know, they're there to guide us so that we're able to make the best decisions for ourselves as Africans, first, as human beings, second. Um, and I love that you set the you, you, you set the tone for that in that a lot of these things that happened to us back in the day, they're still happening to us even now, is the fact that that factor, the it factor of love is missing. And if we could just find that, we will be okay. You know what I mean? All right, uh, Uncle Yid, uh, you've been out of the conversation for a long time. I do apologize uh, for the internet, you know, issues. On behalf of Ghana, our motherland. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I will hand over to you now. But before you go, you, 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 you chip in. I have another question for you guys. Here is another one. Because now we have a lot of winners and we're trying to find the one winner, right? Okay, let's go. The outstretched hand and the quest for political power. I'm looking for the author um, and the book. The outstretched hand and the quest for political power. Okay? Hint, hint, the answer was just given to you, but okay. Um, <laughs> I'll leave it there. And um, I see that the one who gave birth to me or the one from whose quiver I came from, should I say that? <laughs> Our very <laughs> own. <laughs> I look for him. I look for him. My daddy himself has joined us in the studio. And I, I mean, not in the studio, but in the audience. And I wanted to pay homage to him, say hello to him. And I am looking for his submission and I cannot find it. Where is it? <laughs> so many of them coming up. Where is daddy? Where is he? Mm. <laughs> All right, Daddy, we cannot find you, but we greet you. We are so grateful for you. I just told the audience the story about um, Weep Not Child and the stuff that you and I went through. But um, Daddy also had a question for the audience. What was Ngugi Wathiongo's original name before he became Ngugi Wathiongo? So when he, read, we, when he wrote Weep Not Child, what was the name that was on the book? So we have two questions running right now, okay? All right, I will wait for the answer. All right, Yid, over to you. Yeah, so before I delve into my, my next book, and Elsie actually mentioned the title, it's called uh, The Beggar Strike. Um, <laughs> just a little commentary on the poem you read and then the poem mm -hmm. that uh, Elsie read. Um, you, know, you know, I also studied literature. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I found myself in Accra and actually living closer to some of these great whites, like Kofi Awono that I had the chance mm -hmm. of meeting, yes. and then of course the late uh, Atuko Okai, you know, these, mm -hmm. these were like gods to us. And, and, and what they wrote, uh, it, it did so much to us, our young brains growing up. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just want to add, like Elsie said, that we, we will be doing a lot of the service to our kids if we don't, you know, encourage them to read you know, works of the present generation, because Kofi Awono and then just like yesterday, I mean, they are, they are not here with us anymore. Um, 
Then I want to talk about the vultures. Uh, that mm -hmm. poem, oh my God, it, mm -hmm. it did so much, you know, to my young brain. Actually, apart from studying it for exams, um, I think I performed it also. And, wow. and the anger, you know, the anger that, you know, it, it kind of brings out in you, uh, you, would, you would ask yourself, is it the same anger with which, you know, the founders of a lot of African states fought for independence? Mm. Um, the current leaders that we have, is that the kind of anger we have in them? Uh, you know, the vultures, I mean, I think the one who wrote it uh, is, is one of the fathers of the negritude movement, you know, the mm. search for black identity and all of that. Mm. And if you understand what negritude is, uh, you would wonder why Francophone Africa, particularly, is in the state in which it is now. You know, you have coups happening all over. And, you know, here's the irony. A lot of these poets, you know, they used to live in, in France, in the colonial masters countries, in the 30s and the 40s. And they wanted to maintain their identity, their blackness, their tradition, their culture. You know, and so you could find this flowing through their writings and their literature and all of that. But here's the funny thing. Whereas, you know, France colonized Africa and used, you know, uh, the theory of uh, assimilation, if, if I can call it that way, yeah. where they still maintain their culture and identity and all of that. Anglophone Africa, on the other hand, you know, uh, you know, recently that we started protesting. I mean, you would, I would have been wearing a suit and tie, just like my colonial masters, you know, taught me. Now, even though Francophone Africa, they've succeeded in kind of keeping their cultural identity, I keep asking myself why, mm. for all these years, they are still tied to their colonial masters to the extent mm -hmm. that their own money have to be sent to French banks. You know, this is the kind of anger that the vultures still brings up in me. And then I keep asking myself, why? You know, the leaders of these countries, have they read this poem at all? Mm -hmm. what, what, is, what is in it for their people, the people that they lead? You know, interestingly, those of us who were colonized and we seem to like follow in the footsteps of our colonial masters, like you find me drinking tea, you know, English and all of that. But I think that we've been able to be a bit, you know, uh, independent. If you look at uh, Anglophone Africa, uh, there's a little bit of, in the, forget about the fact that we're still tied to them, I mean, uh, through the World Bank and, and all those things. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but something is missing. And I think that, you know, the current crop of, writers youth activists we need to find that missing link why you know we cannot you know completely divorce ourselves economically you know from the ties that is binding us with with our francophone colonial masters you know and uh, anytime i read the vultures i mean that's what it reminds me of you know uh, with this passion you know to keep our identity and all of that and still you know we need to go ask permission from someone to take our own money and hmm. then give it to us in the form of a loan and it will pay interest to them. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Oh, you know. Um, so, that was um, going deep. Would, yeah. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Wow. So I, I, would, I would jump into uh, my next book, which is uh, I mean, not the so false, uh, the biggest uh, strike. By the way, before uh, Yid yeah. goes into that, we still had that question. Um, and here's the question. This will be our tiebreaker. So please, guys, let's do this. The outstretched hand and the quest for political power. This is our uh, tiebreaker, The Outstretched Hand and the Quest for Political Power. Title and author. All right. <laughs> Go ahead, Ian. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, the, the book I would want to talk about is The Beggar Strike. Um, it just makes fantastic reading. Mm. Um, again, it's by a Senegalese writer, just like uh, mm. Maria Maba, set in Senegal and all of that. Uh, I think the city must be Dakar. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, like most African countries, you find this phenomenon where you have, you know, beggars lined up in the streets, you know, uh, and depending on the point of view from which you look at it, they could either be a nuisance or a blessing, <laughs> you know. Now, just to give a brief synopsis of this story, um, so, um, you know, government officials think that uh, beggars have become a nuisance on the streets of, of the city and they must be gotten rid of so that, uh, you know, uh, they can promote tourism, so they don't drive away people who bring their money and, and all of that. 
So they thought clearing these beggars off the streets, uh, at least, would, would bring in the needed uh, foreign exchange and encourage people to visit more. Reason being that these beggars would often almost harass people to give them money, you know. But again, uh, we have this tradition where, you know, our progress and everything in life is tied to uh, some of our religious beliefs. Uh, in Christianity, we have this saying that, uh, you know, blessed is the one that gives, you know, same as the one that takes, or more than the one that takes. Uh, yes. But in Islam, it is one of the five pillars. It, it, it's obligatory for you to give alms, you know, yes. uh, to the poor and the needy. Yes. And so um, uh, the question is, how come beggars strike? Of course, they clear them off the street and they decide to go on strike. Now, those who have their own personal ambitions, political ambitions, religious ambitions and obligations can no more fulfill them because these beggars have gone on strike and they are nowhere to be found. You know, so I hope I've done justice to, you know. You have. <laughs> oh, God. Summary. Now, uh, you know, like Elsie said earlier, we read these texts, you know, to study and all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, even if we didn't read them to study, but we read them with our young minds and it was just like a story. But today, uh, the reality still exists with us. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the themes that run through the book, uh, the themes of principles, the, dream, the themes of corruption, uh, of, of politics, and, and all of that. And uh, today, for instance, you have people migrating into Ghana from our neighboring countries, and all they come to do, yes, of course, you could say it's about, uh, I mean, economic migration and all of that. Mm. But just recently, I, I saw a new story where among those that they interviewed, those who were in Ghana, to, they all came from the same country. Hmm. A group of them were pointing the finger at one man and saying that he didn't have a problem in the country where they came from. He's actually rich. And what he comes here to do is just to beg and to go back and live his last life back, back, back at home. <laughs> you know, so, so <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's a, a professional, uh, you know, beggar <laughs> life there, you know. But then also, you know, it, 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 brings, it brings into question the act of giving. Why do we give? You wow. know, um, we give to, you know, just uh, make ourselves look good. Mm. Uh, you look at social media, people go to donate things and then they take pictures of themselves and show yep. who they are giving to. If you ask if they are happy to have their faces splashed all over, you know, no. Uh, and so uh, all these, um, you know, uh, themes that run through, they live with us today. If, mm. you, if you take politics, for instance, we have our current vice president. One of the issues he has, um, you know, with the Muslim community is that he finds himself in churches these days. Question is, is it for political acceptance or is it just in his nature? You know, mm. you find people vying for political positions going to donate, donate to orphanages, going to donate to people of, you know, that they need and all of that. Is it for the advancement of their politics, the, the, the ambitions that they want to attain, or is it just that act of giving, you know? And you see, one question we don't, we, we fail to often ask ourselves, you know, if, as in Islam, you know, you give so that you, you can be blessed, so you can fulfill one of the five pillars of the religion, as in Christianity, you give so you are blessed. Mm -hmm. Have we asked ourselves the question about the one receiving? Because what it means is that if you take the receiver out of the question, uh, then you, you, you cut short your own blessing. You know, <laughs> you cut off your ambition. Just like in uh, the beggar's tribe, uh, of course, they got to clear the beggars from the street, but this gentleman, I think he's called Moor Ndaye or Ndaje, depending on how the name is pronounced. Uh, eventually, he, he wants to become vice president. There's a vacant position, and he's, you know, warming himself <laughs> to it because he's cleared the biggest of the street, and everybody's happy with him. You know, tourism is booming and all of that. But then, you know, his candidature or his, you know, uh, the likelihood that he'll be chosen as a vice president is threatened because. The marabout who advised him to give, make a sacrifice of a cow and share to the four corners of the city, all of a sudden he realized that there's no beggar. There's no beggar for city. him to give. You oh know. my God. Exactly. You know, and, uh, you know, again, they have to plead with, uh, he has to plead with his director for public health to bring the beggar, but at least 
for some hours, even a day, just for him to be able to give. Uh, but this guy, of course, he's a principled person. He says that, uh, you know, I don't think I'm going to do that. Uh, again, you know, it just takes me back into the narrative style of Aminata So, where mm -hmm. he, I mean, she would kind of fall on flashbacks because mm -hmm. she, she told the story of this young man, uh, I think he's called uh, Keba, mm -hmm. whose principles is explained, you know, through, you know, flashbacks. And Keba virtually was raised by a mother who would not, you know, uh, sacrifice her principles to bring her children up. She would work through the mill and make what she has to make to send them to school. She would not beg, <laughs> you know, she would not bend the rules. And so uh, Murun Dae, who wanted the beggars to be brought back to the streets, found himself working with his assistant, who has principles that would not allow him to do that. And so he looks authority wow. in the face and say, I'm not going to do that, hmm. you know. Uh, and so he's not able to make the sacrifices. Uh, and of course, he doesn't get, you know, uh, selected as a vice president hmm. uh, and all of that. And it is so true today. Uh, if you bring ourselves back to Ghana's position, some time hmm. ago, I can call a... Uh, Masana Miru as, <laughs> you know, uh, the character Keba, because mm -hmm. yes, he was the Mises, you know, government, but he wouldn't, you know, bend the rules to do certain things. And of course, he gets kicked out and he takes on the role of citizen vigilante. I, mm -hmm. I disagree with some of his, uh, his modus operandi, but that is an example of a present day principled person who would right. not bend the rules for anything, even if it means he losing his life or, you know, uh, losing his livelihood in mean, the job i mean and, and most recently of course he was uh appointed as uh, you know the, the prosecutor what uh, was special prosecutor uh mm -hmm. again he resigned that position based on some principles we may not agree with those principles but you know we have it is so present today and i don't ever see uh the lesson from the beggar's choice ending i mean it's so present today and it's going to be ever present tomorrow wow this is a, I, I think for those who haven't read the book, they're now like, you know what? I mean, I haven't read the book. So now I'm like, yeah, you know, I think I read the book listening to you and talk about it. Like, this is it. But um, even though I didn't read the book, I remember I, yesterday I was telling um, you, um, I remember back in the day sitting in the car with um, Hawa Yakubu, our, our auntie Hawa Yakubu and it, it was towards the national service, um, national theater area. Um, at that time, she was minist minist She was in the Ministry of Tourism. I don't know if she was deputy minister at the time or she was actually the minister of tourism. I think she was mm -hmm. deputy minister at the time. And there was a lot. There's a lot of beggars around the national theater area going into the ministries. And every time we will get there, Auntie Howell would roll down her her, her windows. You know in the back and there's a bag in front of her and she would just take out money and give to and so they they started to actually know the car and so every time it will roll up you know it was it was almost like an act it was something that she just did and one of the questions i remember asking her was why she would do that and that's when she 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 talked to me about, uh, you know, beggar's strike. I never read the book, but that's where I remember it from. The fact that she she told me this, um, well, at least the synopsis or the ideas behind beggar's strike. And of course, her reasons for, for giving was entirely different. It wasn't because she was giving because somebody had told her to so she could attain some kind of position. Um, yeah. Not at all. She did it because she remembers where she came from and how much she needed at the time before she became Deputy Minister of Tourism. So anyway, that's just a memory I thought I would throw out there. Um, it looks like we have a lot of ties here. So I will give an easy a very this is a very easy one <laughs> and we will have a tie okay we will have a tiebreaker and we're done this is very easy guys so get ready we're about to, to to you know get off we we scheduled about an hour 30 for this very important conversation this is the very last of the last questions okay um for now abba forson is leading with two points ralia and daddy you guys were automatically disqualified from the james what the question so <laughs> <laughs> you don't get to win anything at all. So we give 
with that. Um, um, and then I think Audrey has two, Baba has two, Kofi has one, uh, uh, Doris, and then of course, Pastor Teresa also. So between Baba and Audrey, this is your tiebreaker. I hope you're ready. And please forgive me if I, I got this wrong, but it's hard to kind of keep track. I hope I got that these were the two that have a tiebreaker. Um, here is the question, okay? <laughs> In Ama Ata Edu's dilemma of a ghost, which two towns presented a dilemma to the protagonist? Which two towns presented a dilemma or dilemma? I say dilemma, other people say dilemma. I don't know, but you know the word, okay? <laughs> to the protagonist, all right? All right, I'm waiting for your answers in the comment section. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and we have an unopposed winner right here. Baba Fawson got it first, and she is our winner. Your prize is this. You get a gift certificate, and you can pick out a book um, from Book Nuke Store, okay? All right, before we have our last and our, our closing statements concerning this conversation, we're going to take one more message from Book Nuke um, as they gave us this um, gift, all right? Here we go, one more message, guys, hang with us. We'll be right back. And we are back. <laughs> Thank you to Book Nook for uh, giving us this gift certificate. We are so grateful. Baba, you are the winner two weeks in a row. Woo! <laughs> All right, closing statements. Um, Elsie, over to you. Read, 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 and then read some more. It's easier now than it was for us back in the day, you know, where you if you're fortunate and lived in a city that had a library, I remember the hours I spent at Ghana Library Board. Now it's a lot easier. There are so many books that are available to read. Um, I remember having to, you know, there's a one logo, logo line, as we used to call it, where one person had a book and you'd say, I'm after you and I'm after you and I'm after you just to get a hold of this book. Mm. Books are life. Books are life. And so... I would just say to everybody that this conversation cannot be had in a, an hour and a half or two. It can't be had in a lifetime. This conversation has to be lived. And so as we tease out these themes that we have from our conversations today, I, I just would like to encourage all of us to go back, find a book, and start from there. You don't have to read. Yes, I know some of us are voracious readers, you know, and can power through an incredible amount of books but just start somewhere and my challenge to all of us is come back home in your choice of books you read include that i'm not saying to the exclusion of all others because we're in a global village and there are many lessons to be learned from all cultures but in order for us to thrive i think we need to know our identity and so Let's come back to reading our stuff, our stories. Let's come back to telling our stories, whether it's the Kwekwa Nances, you know, or the, you know, more complex and more layered themes uh, and, and pieces of literature, the plays, the, the, the poems, the books. Read, 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 and then have conversations. Have conversations around the kitchen table. Have conversations, you know, when you're sitting in your cars. There's a lot of traffic in town. Sit in the cars and read. Mm -hmm. Start conversations with your young ones. And, and let's feed our minds. With that and a redefinition of an identity, we can take on the challenges of the world. I guess that's, that would be my closing message today. God didn't make a mistake in choosing us to be Africans. Mm. There's something that resonates in our spirit when we connect with the land. And books are a wonderful way of doing that. Music is another avenue, but let's be intentional about reconnecting and, and look and, and remember who we are at heart. And then we can find our purpose and then we'll have the tools with which to face the challenges that we have every day. That's it mm. for me. 
I, I see a, a commenter here, I believe from um, um, YouTube. His name or her name is Habisha King Habisha. I am uh, very, very passionate about um, Eritrea and Ethiopia. Um, and we do <clears throat> recognize your passion and we do understand where you're coming from because we are brothers and sisters and we're in this fight together. We will very humbly tell you though to please um, refrain from making certain remarks that are derogatory to other, especially black people and just anybody in the world. Uh, you can always make your point and your comment very clear like we're all doing without necessarily throwing out insults and um, uh, words that would make other people feel less than human. Okay, we thank you for joining us. We thank you for joining, uh, being a part of this conversation, Habesha King. But um, again, please, please, this is a very, um, it's, it's a very open space and we would like for you to not make such remarks, even if it's YouTube. Okay, uh, we're very grateful for that. Thank you, we appreciate you so much. Um, going back to Uncle Yid, um, your closing statements. Yeah, so um, um, did you know that the, uh, the single place outside of India, where you have the largest population of Indians, is, I mean, Indians is in South Africa, Devon. Mm. Uh, I could never have known this if I hadn't read a book called Island in Chains by one, you know, South African writer of Indian origin called Indris Nedo. Mm. Um, you know, just, just to let you know that uh, there's a world of knowledge out there if you read, and I want to end by just sharing some quotes, some quotes that I love about reading, uh, mm. just five of them. Uh, and, and my very favorite one says that a reader lives a thousand lives before he dies. Mm. The man and a dead hard woman who never reads lives only one. <laughs> you know, so that's a quote by one George Martin, he's an American novelist. And then there's this other one that says that until I feared I would lose it, I never loved to read. One does not love mm. reading. You can never get a cup of tea large enough or a book long enough to suit. I find television very educating. Every time somebody turns on the set, I go into the other room and read a book. <laughs> you know. um, and then... <laughs> And then the, the very last one says, so please, oh, please, we beg, we pray, go throw your TV set away. And in this place, <laughs> you can install a lovely bookshelf on the wall. And uh, for this quote to make meaning to you, just look behind Elsie. That's my last one. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> wow, what a wonderful uh, um, closing statement, both of you. Uh, Baba Forsen, the answer to that question uh, was uh, Beggar Strike, and it was by, uh, can you please help me with the, the author, Aminata? Aminata Forsen. Aminata Forsen. So far, okay. so, yeah. Yes. So that was the answer. It was. Oh, I think she may mean the very first question we asked. Eh? Wasn't the very it? first one was uh, Kamau in a uh, weep not child. That was the answer. Kamau, uh, who was Njorege's brother in weep not child. So there were two. But so yeah, those were the answers uh, for those questions that we couldn't answer. Okay. <laughs> and my closing statement is this, uh, just like Dix's Elsie, read and encourage your kids to read. Um, I'm always telling people or anyone who knows me very well knows that my father just flamed. He flamed my, I don't know if I, I grew up just knowing how to read or if he made sure I loved reading and eventually my, my, my sisters, Rally and I were having a discussion on Saturday and I suddenly remembered how she used to kind of <laughs> um, uh, what's the word like tag on to the books I was reading but you know how sisters do she will end up destroying my books and we had a lot of fights about that but a home like that also what it breeded was a lot of closeness I remember my one of my books cried a beloved country <laughs> Yes, that Ralia took from me, read it, and I, yeah, I think it was soaked in water and torn up at some point, 
we're going to still have that fight, Ralia. Um, and then <laughs> there was, I, I think, another book, Money Galore by Amu uh, Joleto, yeah. that, uh, again, yeah, Ralia Joleto. took from me. But what all of this to say that feed it, make it look appealing uh, to your kids. One of the things my dad did for me that made me feel so special was he got a stamp specially made for me with my name and, and the address. <laughs> And it said, uh, you know, Baraka's library. And it was, it was a, a cute little stamp. And you would take it. You had your cute little ink. And so whenever we got a new book, I, I was so excited to go and get the stamp and put it in the book. <laughs> and that was, you know, it was just a very simple act, but so beautiful now that I am older, realizing these are some of the things that made me want to read. And the fact that your dad will look at you with a big smile and say, oh, that is right. I don't remember if I ever got any gifts for my right answers, but just that look that says, wow, I have an intelligent child made you want to do more. So my closing statement, especially to all parents, and even if you're not a parent, but you're an aunt, you're an uncle, uh, you're a grandfather, whatever you are, just make reading fun again. I know Bixis is doing that. And I know um, Uncle Yid is doing that. Are you? That's my closing statement, okay? All right, guys, this has been a lot of fun, a lot of fun. We had so many other questions, but we have our winner on Dispute at Baba Forsen, so we're going to leave it there. Yay. <laughs> and um, I saw Nana Redamo here, um, our sponsor for today's um, um, our sponsor uh, for today's prize, Book Nook, um, through Elsie Dixon. So we are very, very grateful for that. Thank you, Nana Redamoa. Thank you, Elsie. And of course, thank you, Book Nook. Thank you, thank you. Check out Book Nook, everyone. You will not be sorry. Baba will reach out to you after the show and you will have your gift now. Next week um, is the opening or the beginning of the third month of the year. Um, over at To My Younger Self, we are very prayerful people and we like to be very strategic with the people we bring on to kind of open up uh, a month for us or a quarter of a, a year and on so on and so forth. So hang on to your hats, guys. Next week, uh, joining us will be the very reverend himself, very reverend Moses Kofi Jesse. OK, and he is going to. Uh, I'm going to just not tell you what he's going to be sharing, but he's going to be sharing some personal stories that will knock you off your feet. OK, you do not. I promise you, I double, double dare promise you, you do not want to miss this. Yes, Audrey, for real. OK, this amazing man of God is not only funny, he is deep. He is he reminds me so much of Archbishop Benson Idahosa, so filled with fire, but also hilarious to a T. Let me tell you, you're going to get a lot of life lessons next week. You do not. I promise you do not want to miss it. Guys, this has been fun. My name is Zoe Baraka. I am so grateful that you hang in there with us and you're making to my younger self what it is today because of you. We're so thankful. I want to thank... Uh, I don't know what to call these guys anymore. I, I, I'm looking for a word. I'm looking for, for a, but I, I don't know. They're not only my producers, they're something else. Again, I am not sharing any of them. So please do not ask. But I want to thank Elsie Dixon. God bless you. This woman. Oh my God. Oh my God. Anyway, no words. I want to thank you, Yidana, who is my uncle and my brother. <laughs> That's a story for another day. I do not know what to say, but these guys are go-getters. If I tell you, here's another lesson for you. When you're doing something and you ask God to bring you people, he will bring you the right people, okay? I do not know how they came to me, except they're here, and I cannot be more grateful. I cannot tell it enough. God bless you guys. This has been wonderful. Um, Thank and you for having us. Seriously, that's what you're going to end with. <laughs> Thank you to our audience. Yes, we will Thank go you with to that. Our audience, really. We'll go with that because without yes. you guys, we would not have taken uh, off at all. Guys, we love you dearly. We're going to close out, but 
keep the conversation going on the side, okay? God bless you. We'll see you next week with Reverend Moses. Bye. <laughs>